All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the Storage Investor Nation webinar for this week. We're going to be talking about how a self-storage syndicator makes money. So how do you make money bringing together investors and actually syndicating or putting together a deal when it comes to self-storage? And we're going to be talking about lots of different things here today. We're going to be talking about these capital gain splits, the various fees that you can charge, how to bake them into your underwriting, and then some additional strategies for maybe how to answer some questions from your investors if they start to ask you questions as to why you're getting paid some of these different fees, okay? So we're gonna dive into that. First off, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Dan Hanford. I'm one of the managing partners here at a group called PassiveInvesting.com. We acquire both multifamily as well as self-storage assets across the country. And uh, you actually can, can go to our website if you're interested in joining us on some of our future opportunities, you can join, click on this little blue button here on the top right-hand corner, and it'll allow you to be able to have a form here to fill out so we can just uh, jump on a phone call with you, discuss your investment goals to see if our group is the right fit for you. Our offerings are only available to accredited investors at this time. So if you don't know what that is, go to our website. You can see there's a link right here. You can click on that to see what an accredited investor is. And we look forward to having you join us on some of our future offerings. We do actually have two offerings available right now. One's called Ascend Waterly. It's actually a multifamily asset. That one's closing the first full week of July to week of July 5th. It's almost full. Um, and uh, the real estate debt fund that we have as well is two things that you can look at. Um, actually, later this week, we will be releasing uh, a, a, a debt, not a debt fund, but a, an equity fund, a storage equity fund uh, that's going to be called our, our, our self-storage fund. And so that will be released later this week. So if you want to find out more information about that, certainly go to our website, join our investor list, and look forward to sharing that with you as it gets released. If you want to learn more about me and our team here at PassiveInvesting.com, you can go there. You can see my information here, Dan Hanford. Um, I'm actually located here in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm married, have four children, and a, and a, and a, and a standard poodle named Bella. Um, and uh, and our, we have a, a, an exciting uh, team here that you can actually go through each one of our bios to kind of you know, research each one of us. Um, our two main uh, uh, self-storage team members is Chris Bennett here, as well as John Allen. They head up our acquisitions and finance arm for our, uh, our, our self-storage div um, division, if you will. Um, but uh, feel free to go here, read out, read some more information about what we're doing and some of the things that we have, and then also look at our current offerings. And if you haven't heard about it yet, we have the Storage Investor Nation Summit coming up it's in October, on October 7th, 8th, and 9th. You can go here, check out the actual speaker lineup that we have. We have over 50 speakers that will be attending, that will not be attending, well, they'll be attending too, but uh, they will be participating with this event. Hundreds of actual attendees that will be part of this. So make sure you go there, check out the event. Look forward to seeing you at the event in October. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into this topic um, of how does a cell storage syndicator make money, okay? And so let's first talk about some of the fees. I know I put on here first, capital gains, splits, things like that. We'll talk about that. It's a little bit of a longer story, longer conversation. So before I go into that, I'm going to talk about some of these fees. So there's two main fees that you're going to see um, on these on, on a self-storage syndication and how a self-storage self syndicator makes money. First off, you're going to see acquisition fees. An acquisition fee is a fee that is paid to the operator or syndicator for really kind of putting the deal together, bringing in the finance piece, bringing in the actual asset itself, doing all the due diligence, bringing in the investors to allow the actual deal itself to go forward, right? And so they're going to be paid what's called an upfront acquisition fee. That, that fee is typically paid upon closing of the asset, and it's usually going to be in the range of about mm, 2 to 3%, right? Uh, depending on the size of the asset, if it's a smaller acquisition, it might get closer to like maybe 4 to 5%, but typically you're going to see that fee anywhere between about 2 to 3%. The other thing you're going to, you're going to see as far as uh, fees are concerned is an asset management fee. The asset management fee is an ongoing fee that is actually paid to the operator or to the sponsor based on the overall income of the asset. Now, there's two different ways to do this. You could do it on the overall income of the asset, and that's usually paid out monthly. Or you can do it on, if you have a fund, usually in a fund, you'll see that the asset management fee 
is a fee that is paid out on the overall amount of capital that's in the fund as well. And these fees usually range between about one to 3% as well, depending on the size of the asset and the amount of the equity that's in the, deals, in, in the deal as well. Now, those are kind of the two most common fees that you'll see. You'll also see one that's called a disposition fee or a refinance fee, where when you sell the asset or you refinance, or sometimes people call it a capital event fee, those fees are um, going to be fees that are paid whenever a refinance has occurred or when you sell the asset. I know some of you are asking here, are there any other slides that we're seeing? No, I don't use slides or anything like that. So I'm going off of the list that we have here on the webinar registration page. So um, there are not gonna, there's not going to be any slides or anything like that. The main reason, I'll tell you the main reason uh, why I don't do slides, because we are trying to do these consistently every single week, and it takes a lot of time to prepare with a bunch of slides and designs and things like that. So um, we usually don't use slides because we want to make sure that we can maintain the, the consistency of being able to provide this content to you on a regular basis. So uh, we've been doing this now. Uh, well, for the self-storage side, we've been doing it for um, about, uh, I guess, about six months or so. But with the, uh, we also have another group called the Multifamily Investor Nation, and we've been doing that for several years now. So um, there's definitely uh, reasons behind some of the things that we do and we, uh, we don't do, but just wanted to give you that additional feedback as well there for about the slides. All right, so let's talk about four fees that maybe you've never heard of before that there's a reason why you've never heard of them before, but there's definitely fees that you could charge. It's not, it's not that I'm telling you or say, suggesting that you should charge them, but they are definitely are, there are definitely four fees that you could charge if you so choose. And I've seen a few people use these fees and I feel like sometimes certain deals can get what we call fee heavy, where there's just so many fees left and right that the investors feel like they're being nickeled and dimed all over the place and their return every time you add a fee in there starts to diminish. And so the first kind of fee that's not a very common fee is what is called a broker fee. Now, I'm not talking about a mortgage broker fee that's normally charged. That's totally different. I'm not talking about a commission or a fee that's charged to the, the actual real estate broker or anything like that. I'm just talking about I've, you can actually charge what is called a broker fee where because you're brokering the deal, you're bringing the investors and you're bringing in the the, the real estate themselves, there's been fees that I, I've seen some fees they are called broker fees. And it might even be a third party that's helping you do all this. And the third party, what I've seen before is, is I've seen the broker fee included for a fee that is being charged by a mentor group that helped put everything together, right? So they, this, give you an example, this multifamily investor, they're new, they're a newbie, they want to learn, learn the ropes. So they paid, I don't know, $20,000, $40,000 for this mentor to be able to teach them and help them along the way. And the broker, I mean, the, the, the mentor is also going to charge a broker fee because he helped teach and put all this stuff together and get another fee. Again, not something that I would highly recommend or suggest, but it's definitely another fee that I've seen out there that uh, you've probably never heard of before. I've also seen another fee, which is a, a real estate fee or real estate commission fee where the because the, the syndicator themselves might be a real estate broker, a real estate agent or whatever, they're gonna also charge an additional fee on top of that for maybe a buyer side commission, if you will. So again, again, all these fees can get really too expensive for the deal to make sense. We try to bake in too many fees, but again, those are, that's another fee that you could charge. I've also seen underwriting fees where maybe somebody uses an outside third party to underwrite their deals for them. And that particular underwriter gets a third, gets what's called a, a, an underwriting fee. I would caution you here on this because when your underwriter is getting bonused like that, it could also make, make the underwriter want to or have the temptation, if you will. I'm not saying that they would, but it creates an, an open temptation for that underwriter to kind of bake the underwriting, if you will, or cook the books, if you will, however you want to look at it and make the underwriting look better than it really is, just so that they can get their fee and they can move on, right? So you wanna be careful when it comes to those fees. Again, these four fees that I'm sharing with you are fees that we've never charged, and we don't ever plan to charge, but they're fees that you've probably never heard of before that some people do. It's just, my, I, we don't actually do it with our group. 
And I don't highly recommend it either because I don't think it's, uh, it's de definitely, definitely necessary to be able to be a successful syndicator. The fourth fee that I would say is a less common fee or one that you've maybe never heard of before is an accounting or a tax fee. So at the end of every year, they can charge a percentage of, ec of the equity or whatever as a charge for maintaining the, 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 the accounting and the books for the actual entity itself that's buying the asset. That would be considered an accounting or, an, or, a, or a tax fee. Now, the taxes, the fees for the accounting, like if you're going to hire an outside CPA firm, that's usually what we do. We're going to hire a third-party CPA. They're going to manage the books. They're going to manage everything. They're going to charge the entity anyway a fee. I don't feel like we need to charge another fee on top of that. Plus, our asset management fee is what's helping pay for and offset some of those costs that we have from a personnel perspective to be able to manage the asset from the tax side of things as well. So again, I don't necessarily think that's a very good fee to charge, but it is a fee that you could charge. Now, enough about fees. I think I've told you about a lot of different fees out there. One of the other fees, one of the other things that you can charge, that you can charge, what you should be doing is what is called capital gains splits. So if you're, what we always recommend doing a preferred return. So if, a, if there should be a preferred return in your asset, so you're going to do a, a preferred return, which means 100% of the cash flows up to a certain percentage, say 7% or so. So 100% of the cash flows up to 7% are going to go to the investors so that we can make sure we align our interests very well with our investors and we protect their downside. And then after that 7%, there's going to be a equity split of the rest of the profits, say 70% to the investors. 30% to us, I mean, to, yeah, to us as the operator. So it's that 70-30 split. And that's what we're going to get into here is, is what we call the waterfall of what we're talking about. So the waterfall is where you have multiple hurdles in this kind of uh, waterfall approach. Let me see if I can actually share my screen with you to share with you a little bit about what I'm talking about when it comes to the, uh, the waterfall. Let's see here. So here's my screen here. So I want you to think about the waterfall structure like a, a bunch of buckets, okay? Like a bunch of buckets, if you will. I'm gonna do a uh, larger line here and do blue. So here we go. Here's bucket number one. Here is bucket number two. And here is bucket number three. And then let's just see if we can put another bucket down here. So in this waterfall, okay? This is what you kind of want to think about it as, is a waterfall. There's gonna be certain hurdles, right? Let's say there's going to be a hurdle here, a hurdle here. Technically, there's a hurdle up here, um, and then not usually one down here. So what we're going to do here is, is what you're going to see is as, I guess I probably should have used the water as, uh, uh, I'm going to use green right now, but I mean, you should have used it as blue for water. But the first hurdle in this waterfall, okay, because what's going to happen is, is this first bucket is going to continue to fill up until we get to this first hurdle. And then the rest of the cash flow is going to spill over into the next bucket until this bucket fills up. And then it's going to hit that next hurdle here. And then it's going to spill over here, right? Until that fills up again as well. It's going to hit that next hurdle and it's going to spill over, right? So that's actually what we would consider a waterfall, right? And so and then the hurdles are the different points throughout the cash flow distributions or the sale proceeds of where the money goes. So let's just give you an example. So let's say we're going to do a waterfall where you're going to have this first hurdle is going to be the, the oops, excuse me, let me actually do a 7% preferred return. So this is going to be the 7% pref. So we're going to say 100% of the cash flows. 100% of the cash flows up to this 7% pref are going to go to the LPs, right? The LPs. And then, so technically, I, what I should have done is, is created a little section in here in the bucket, right? Because now, after this preferred return, the cash is going to go forward into, this, into these buckets until we get a 70-30 split, right? So we have this 70-30 split. And then once we achieve a certain IRR hurdle, let's just say a 13% IRR, then the rest of the cash flow is going to go into the next bucket, which again, might be split as well, but this might be a 50-50 split here, right? 50-50 split. And once this is achieved and 
we don't usually go past this number of hurdles, but let's say we put another hurdle in here that once you get a 20% IRR, the rest of the bucket goes, you know, maybe it goes the other way around, maybe 30% to the LPs and 70% to the operator because it will highly incentivize the operator to outperform past that 20% IRR. This is what is called a waterfall. And it also has the hurdles within the waterfall, right? And then it also has the various equity splits or promotes along the way. So you can see how an actual operator makes money. Now, this particular webinar is not really, I wasn't planning on getting into the weeds, the nuances of these various hurdles, and the different waterfall structures that could be set up. If you go to our YouTube channel, we actually do have other videos that we have done on these various waterfalls and hurdles and equity splits. We did an entire webinar on it. So you can certainly go to our YouTube channel, type in uh, a capital st stack structures or capital stack or, or structures or waterfalls. And you should be able to find those videos that we've done that actually break down these different uh, uh, waterfalls and, and equity splits and hurdles a little bit further. But that's the other way that a self-syndicator makes money, self-storage syndicator makes money. And you should be able to see that on the capital gain side, that's actually where the syndicator makes the most money is when you actually sell an asset, right? So as long as the asset performed well and continued to do cash flow and you were able to sell the asset for what you had originally projected or better, then that's where the investor, the actual uh, GP, the operator, the syndicator makes the most money. So they are definitely incentivized to wanna to make sure that they continue to perform on the asset, perform on the business plan and fully execute it. So those are the main things I wanted to cover there. How you bait these into your underwriting is that you wanna make sure that you don't overfee yourself, right? So I've seen sometimes that deals just, I get people that come say, well, the, the, the deals sometimes just don't make sense. And I start to ask them, well, what fees are you charging? And they have way too many fees. So if you're underwriting and you feel like you're not getting the, getting the returns you're looking for um, on your underwriting for your investors, it's because maybe your fees are too high. Maybe you need to adjust your fees or change your equity splits to make it more appealing for your investors, okay? Um, and then so a lot of times you'll get, in, get investors that'll ask you questions like, well, it seems like you're making quite a bit of money on these acquisition fees, and the asset management fee. You know, why are you getting paid those fees? And you just have to stand firm and you have to be confident with the fees that you charge. Because I've had investors that have looked at our deals and they've, I've actually only had two, um, looked at our deals and they've looked at them and they said, I think your fees are too expensive. And I go, okay, well, I, I'm sorry you feel that way, but the fees are, what we have in our deals are pretty common and pretty standard. They're not over and egregious and they're not any of these weird fees that I've never seen before. They're typical standard fees. And so if for some reason these fees make you feel uncomfortable, then there's no point in you even staying on our investor list because our fees aren't going to change. So you want to make sure that when you explain things to your investors, you explain it to them in a very confident and competent manager manner and explain to them, you know, well, the acquisition fee is to pay us for all the headaches we had to go through to actually find this deal, build relationships with brokers, find this needle in the haystack, underwrite these deals, and not to mention the hundred other deals that we underwrote, submitted some LOIs on a few of those, missed out on those, and finally found this one, right? So there's a lot of extra work that goes into it in finding these deals instead of just, just the deal at hand. And then, of course, being able to bonus some of our staff and our team from some of these fees as well is also very helpful. So I'm going to open it up for some questions. I do see one question that's coming in here, so I'll open it for some questions. I have time for maybe uh, about five minutes worth of questions here, maybe 10 minutes. And then uh, we'll wrap it up here and finish it up. And then next week, we actually have another topic coming on. Next week is going to be Chris Bennett. He's going to be, he's one of our uh, managing partners on the self-storage side. And he's going to be talking about why investing in self-storage in multiple markets makes sense. So we're talking about um, some pros and cons of searching for deals within and outside of your local market. Why going outside your local market is better and how to find deals outside your local market. So make sure you stay tuned for that. There's a link in the chat box there if you want to register for that next webinar that's coming up uh, next week. It's going to be next week on June 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern, right here, same time, but different host. 
So I've got a question here from Frenchy. If the preferred return is up to 7% in the first bucket, that means anything after the 7% is split 70-30. Yes, that is correct. So when we go back to this whiteboard presentation here, yes, that's correct. So 100% of the cash flows to the investors up to that 7%. That's the true definition of a preferred return. Anything else after that is going to be split 70-30, unless you have a secondary hurdle, which would be maybe this 13% IRR or maybe a 20% IRR, and that would roll over to the various buckets based on those various hurdles. Now, it is possible to have a 7% preferred return with a GP catch-up. Now, the GP catch-up on a preferred return is actually usually too rich to be able to make the deal make sense unless you're underwriting for a refinance in years two or three. Now, I highly recommend never investing in a deal if it has a refinance or if it has a refinance in years two or three or anywhere in the deal at all, because if the deal is contingent upon the refinance, then the deal is too tight and I don't want to invest in it, right? And so uh, the GP catch-up, even though it's great for you as the operator, it also dilutes, reduces the returns for the investors and it's hard to get there without a refinance, okay? And so for me, and for our group, we would like to see the refinance still want to do it, right? So not, don't get me wrong. I don't want to like not do a refinance, but I want it to be the cherry on top, the icing on the cake, the sugar coating, right? I want it to be extra. I don't want it to be what's, what makes the deal. I don't want it to be contingent upon whether or not the deal makes sense or not as to whether or not we could do a refinance. And usually when you see a preferred return with a GP catch up, that usually means that there's going to be a refinance modeled into it. That's the only way those GPK catch ups will really make sense at this point in time in the market because of how tight some of these deals are. So it's, and, and again, if you don't see a preferred return with a GP catch up, but you see a, a refinance modeled into it, it usually means they're too fee heavy, it means they have too many fees. And they're usually, break, they, they usually have to bake in a refinance in order for the, the, the actual returns to make sense for their investors. And if you want to find out more information about some of these things I'm mentioning to you, I wrote an article called The Red Flags for Passive Investing, uh, Passive Real Estate Investing. And it goes through several red flags, including these, about the preferred returns, the, re the preferred returns with a GP catch-up, as well as um, the, re the modeling of a refinance. So if you want to find out more information about some of those additional uh, items that I discussed there, um, you can go to our website, go to passiveinvesting.com. And in the Knowledge Center, you can actually type in red flags and you can have that article that will be available to you. And actually, uh, uh, we've all, Melissa just typed into the chat box for those of you who are joining us live, a link that'll go straight to that article, which is the red flags. It says for passive apartment investing, but it's red flags for real estate investing in general. Um, we just do passive apartment investing as well as self-storage investing with our team. So you can make sure that you go there and check that out. All right, so let me see. I have one more questions. One more question. I have one more question in here and then we'll wrap it up for today. Oh, I actually got a couple more questions in here. Um, asset management fee is charged quarterly, correct? So the asset management fee, um, it doesn't, is not necessarily charged quarterly. It can be charged quarterly, monthly, or annually, or biannually. So however you want to set it up. We typically do monthly. So our asset management fee is based off of uh, typically in a non-fund structure off of the, the actual uh, assets, excuse me, the asset management fee is usually charged based off of the overall income of the asset from the prior month. And so it's paid on a monthly basis, but if you wanted to do it quarterly, you certainly could do that. Let's see, is the operator in the waterfall actually putting up money initially? I highly recommend, yes, that they do. I personally won't invest with an operator if they don't have skin in the game and, they don't, and, don't, and they're not putting up that money to begin with. So I would highly recommend that uh, the operator put money into the investment. Now, usually it's alongside the LPs. So if you're raising, say, you know, a million dollars, $5 million, and they're going to put up some money, it's going to be alongside the LPs in an LP position next to them. For a first-time syndicator, is there a minimum and maximum deal size? I, I would say that there probably is, but it's probably not as low as you might think, and, and the deal size is probably higher than you think. Uh, what I mean by that is, is 
you know, the very first deal that our group put together was an $8.9 million deal and we raised two and a half million dollars for it. And fast forward to today, you know, this deal uh, that we're closing at the beginning of next month is a $91.6 million deal. And we're raising just over $31 million to acquire that deal, right, from our investors. So we've definitely grown over the years. But when we first got started, we still started off with a pretty large deal. And now we, we're, we limit ourselves to, you know, certain markets and certain deals and sizes and things like that. But for the first time syndicator, what I would recommend is, is joining another group and getting your feet wet, building your credibility, building your experience level, especially if you want to get into some of the, the larger assets when it comes to, to, to sell storage, because it'll allow you to get where you want to go a whole lot faster than kind of, you know, tiptoeing and walking or walking, if you will, inside of the smaller space. Is the real estate attorney, the person who writes the contracts regarding the waterfalls, typically it's gonna be your securities attorney. So when it comes to these syndications, you definitely need to have a good syndication attorney. And so uh, uh, one of the actual syndication attorneys that has sponsored the Storage Investor Nation Summit that's coming up in October. And we actually the one that we use is actually Dugan Kelly. And he works with a group called Kelly Clark Law. And so you can figure out, you can, you can find out more information about him, um, but he does both the, contra, the real estate contract law from the transactional side, but also from the securities side as well to make sure that you're following all the securities rules when it comes to these syndications. If you're a real estate agent and you want to collect a brokerage fee, aren't you just double dipping on an acquisition fee? Technically, yes, Ron, uh, you definitely are. Some people still do it, but yes, you can double dip there if you wanted to. And as long as you've disclosed that to your investors and they're okay with it, then you can certainly do it. But it would definitely be a, a bit of a double dipping, if you will. Let's see, follow up. If so, does that change the 70-30 split? Um, so it doesn't necessarily change the 70-30 split because you're investing alongside the investors. So if you're going to put money alongside your investors, you're going to own a portion of that 70%, 70 at the, that you're giving to your investors because you're putting up a, a, a portion next to it. So the GP would still be 30%. The LPs would still be 70%. You would want to keep those two things separate there. Um, let's see here. Are there lenders that specialize in refinancing multifamily? Um, well, this isn't a multifamily, but this is self-storage. But there's definitely on both lender, on both sides of the table, whether it be self-storage or on the multifamily side, yes, there are lenders that specifically specialize in refinancing. And the best thing that I would suggest is for you to go through a broker that would actually help you actually do that because those brokers will be able to know who, who is out there and who is ready to be able to do that um, when it comes to the, uh, the self-storage side as well as the multifamily front. Now, that's all the questions that I have here today. So I want to thank each one of you for joining me. Thank you for those questions. I love it when I get questions. One last thing that I wanted to mention to you is about our podcast. We launched our podcast about two months ago and it has already gotten some great reviews. And I would love it and ask for you to go there, go to iTunes, go to your, your Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast, and search for Storage Investor Nation. Or if you go to the, the website here, you can just click on it and you can see some of the, the actual um, episodes that we've already released, that we already have so far. And the podcast itself is something that will help you in your journey because we interview people who are closing real deals every single day. So we don't just interview a bunch of gurus, only, only interview people who are closing real deals. And if you go to that, if you go and you click on that link, for some reason, mine's not loading here for some reason. Oh, there it is. You can see there's already some other ones. We interviewed a 94 unit storage spot in Midway, Georgia, an acquisition there, 84 unit out of Morganton, North Carolina, 53 unit, 250 unit, 206 unit, 440 unit dollar smart storage in Martinsville, Virginia. All of these people on this podcast or people that we're interviewing are closing real deals. And right now we have two ratings on our podcast. And I know dozens more of you are already listening to this podcast. And I would highly recommend you go there and subscribe to it. And please help us out and make a review and rate their podcast. I promise you that you're going to enjoy this podcast and you will learn a ton about self-storage investing as well. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Look forward to having you next week at the 
uh, store at the store <laughs> at the Storage Investor Nation webinar coming up. This is going to be this next one's going to be with Chris Bennett. And he'll be talking here about these self storage, why investing in self storage in multiple markets is such a great thing. So uh, have a great rest of your week. Look forward to seeing you uh, next week at the next webinar series. And also make sure you go register for the October uh, MF. I mean, <laughs> I'm at the MFI and Summit. No, uh, go. We actually have an MFI and Summit coming up this weekend. But go look up the Storage Investor Nation Summit coming up in October. So thank you so much about being here and looking forward to seeing you back next week.